Hello, everybody, and welcome to the HTML All Things Podcast, episode 94, more important than the MVP. I'm your host, Matt Lawrence, and I'm joined again by my co-host, Mike Coran. If you've been enjoying that podcast so far and you want to support us, there's a couple of ways that you could do that. You can review us on the Apple Podcast or the podcast platform that you're listening to this on. You can also check us out on that Patreon. There's only a couple of tiers, but the $3 tier will give you a shout-out in the podcast and share a link to your and we'll share a link to your website in our show notes. And more most importantly, and uh, most the most most and most importantly, I'm not I'm, I think I'm th- I'm thinking too much about our new intro that we have planned, and I'm screwing up the old one. Most importantly, Make sure that you share this with your friends and let let them know that we're here and ready to be listened to. And if you or your friends are ready uh, to go a step further, you can come hang out with us in our Discord server. We've got tons of chat in there from gaming stuff to movie stuff to programming stuff, of course. So come hang out in our Discord server and say hi. Now, I'd like to state one thing is that we do still have uh, stickers on the go. We still have sticker, a sticker planned, but this COVID thing has completely destroyed our idea of shipping. So I just wanted to say that in an episode, I've been meaning to say that in the last couple, that it's not that we've forgotten that plan and it's fallen through. It's literally that I don't want to be shipping packages that, you know, I don't want to be shipping packages in this climate straight up. That's the truth. So I've been sharing the odd uh, sampler that we have for our stickers, but rest assured that we still have a plan to do it. We just don't want to be shipping in this health climate, if that makes sense. So, anyway, weekly pain points. Mike, please take it away. All right. And speaking of the health climate, my weekly pain point is quote unquote easing lockdowns. Um, So, it's kind of weird to me. Like, my problem is, is I don't know what to do because we're in... We're in Canada. We're in Ontario. Ontario's in phase one of easing a lock, easing lockdowns, which means we're opening up parks, we're opening up retail stores that have an outdoor entrance, uh, we're opening up construction sites, a bunch of like stuff that is deemed essential, like essential um, to starting the economy. But I don't, I don't know if I feel safe enough to go to like a retail store just to go to a retail store. That's my, that's my thing. Like I. Where we are, like in Hamilton, uh, it's outside of Toronto, like an hour away from Toronto. Matt's in Caledonia, which is even farther than that. There's not that many cases here, realistically. Like they're just, it, it, there isn't too much threat to us. But somehow I'm still not feeling okay with going places that have a lot of people in them. I have potential to have a lot of people in them unless I like essentially need to go like a grocery store. Is that, how? how do you feel about that? Uh, so my county, because I live in a town outside of Hamilton, so my county is pretty was hit pretty hard in terms of old age homes, sadly, and stuff like that. Uh, and I, I, I've kind of tuned out to the news, but I did hear about the odd person, obviously, just you know, out and about, not in an old age home that got it. I think a factory worker at some point got it or something. So, uh, don't quote me on that again. I'm, I've been in and out of the news because I just find it depressing. But, um. To answer your question, I don't know, honestly. I don't know how to treat anything right now. I don't know how to treat... Well, I mean, it, it's true. That's the pain point, yeah. That's essentially what my problem is, too. So I've been treating it like regular. So I didn't... I haven't been to a retail store in a while. I've been ordering stuff online. I uh, The only retail, if you'll even call it that, store I go to is a weekly trip to the grocery store. Short of helping a a couple of family members or something like that where I need to go to the store for them. Uh, I went into one store in Hamilton, one grocery store that was, and this was pre-easing lockdown. And I'm not, I'm not calling out names or anything, but uh, I am not entering that place again until, until COVID is over. That place was an absolute calamity, uh, an absolute calamity. There were people everywhere. And what's weird is how quickly that became a calamity back a few weeks or, you know, eight weeks ago or something in the beginning of the year, it would have just been, Oh, it's a crowded day. But this is now, Oh my God, there's people near me. This is a calamity. So the urgency of a, of a crowd is really big. Um, I think that, I think that we need more guidance socially, which I I think is coming from the government here, our local government. They said they're going to talk about gatherings and stuff. So that should help. Um, again, I don't listen to the news every day, so I don't know how behind I am. But I think I'm going to take that news 
and then put my own spin on it as I always do in terms of personal advice. So in this case, if they say it's safe, I might wait a few weeks and then be like, okay, it's safe or something along those lines. Also, That's probably a safe bet. Also, like if you start seeing people go into places and the numbers don't spike, then I think that's part, pretty much what I'm going to be doing in those three weeks, two to three weeks. That's sort of where I'm at. I have lacked some stuff, so I have been, well, I guess I really haven't. I mean, short of seeing my girlfriend once on my birthday, that was it. That was my only really like external person coming to visit me. That's it. That's it. Yeah, I mean, I I guess I've really still been in lockdown. It's just the new normal now. It really is. I'm just used to just existing here. And, you know, Caledonia is a, you know, a semi-large town, but it's also still a town. So I would leave it a lot because it's a town. It doesn't have everything. And there's a city really close. Hamilton's really close. And so you would just go to Hamilton and that would be like a normal everyday thing. And I haven't, I've been there twice, three times maybe which is crazy in the amount of weeks. So it's yeah. That's, yeah. Sounds, I mean, that's sounds it. Like you're, we're in the same boat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it sounds like, like we're in the same. It's just a pain point. It's just a pain point. Yeah. It's just, it's just weird. But uh, I, I mean, I'd like to hear other people's experience to see what the heck they're doing. So if you guys are you know, on a discord server, hitting up, hitting up our, our socials, not to be trendy, but I, I'm seriously curious as to how people are handling this because I kind of want to crowdsource an answer for myself not that you should follow a crowdsourced answer. Please follow your local your local health officials and local government and stuff like that. But I, I just want to personally crowdsource an answer for myself. Uh, but um, my weekly pain point is actually podcast apps. So I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but I was using CastBox for a while. And I just I was having some trouble with their casting. So I cast a, a Google Nest devices. And I don't know whether that's been fixed. I know there was a couple patches and stuff. But I, I, I had trouble with them in the past. And then they just started having these full screen ads and I really didn't want to pay per month. And so I decided to go on Google podcast because it, you know, it's a natural thing since I use so many Google nest devices. And I'm going to say this right now, the, the, the iPad experience is not an iPad experience. It's an iPhone experience. And that's, that's a ding, but it's not a big ding for, cause for me, I go in there, I press play on a podcast and I leave. Right. So it's not the, the biggest thing in the world. The discovery on Google Podcasts isn't the greatest, although I didn't really use the discovery of CastBox that much, and the discovery of CastBox is renowned a bit, so people love that that discovery on there, so I might be back in CastBox soon. Also, CastBox has another app called Podcast Player or something, and it's, I don't know why they have two apps. I, I, again, this is me superficially not doing research like crazy. This is me as a consumer, you know, flipping through the app store. So I'm not getting all the facts. So I've tried, I'm trying Google podcasts. And then, uh, we got some disturbing news, which will actually be a tidbit this week or possibly next week. Our next tidbit anyway, is that Joe Rogan signed an exclusivity deal with Spotify. Now I'm not dinging him for it. He got paid. Uh, I hear a large amount. So I don't know whether it's a confirmed amount or whatever. So I won't mention the number here, but he's definitely getting some sort of financial benefit from this obviously so now it's like (laughs) i listen to joe rogan a lot so how do now i'm on google podcast and i know this is such a first world problem but for a ux guy it's i just got settled in google podcast i just got my playlist working i got everything to work i figured out the quirks and the little the caveats and the the good parts and the bad like all of it i figured all that out for the most part having used it for about a week and now it's like great my number one podcast i listened to is gone so now i gotta have another app this is gonna become like chat apps yep we'll talk about it on the tidbit though I we'll talk about it on the tidbit yeah so that's been my weekly pain point. I even tried to write a medium post about it and I just can't gather all my thoughts on it because it's such a crazy, like not the Joe Rogan thing. This, the podcast world on Android is just crazy. There's no de facto. Oh, this is preloaded like Apple podcasts. I mean, I guess Google podcast is your close, is your close thing, but that's even, that's kind of newer. So I don't know. It, it's a mess. I uh, yeah, it's a mess. So th- th- that's my thing. But this is a me heavy episode this week, and it's about um, what I call cornerstones. So obviously the episode indicative, m- more important than the MVP. 
I'm going to get into it. It's a little weird to explain, but it's something that I experienced firsthand, and I have a whole bunch of examples of stuff like that in the episode. And then our uh, web news this week is going to be repurposing old tech, and that's going to be a, a mic-heavy web news. So I'm just going to dive right in here to, um, well, I mean, the only segment is <laughs> Cornerstones. So as you probably know, the, the MVP stands for Minimum Viable Product, uh, and in the context of tech, it's the version of the app or website or other project that uh, will be released to the public initially, and then will be built upon with updates. So the MVP is basically a compilation of all the bare minimum features required to meet the goal of the project. So for example, if you're making a podcast app, your MVP will need to include subscribing, playing, and discovery, and future updates can add things like casting, sleep timers, and those sort of superficial features that some people can consider viable, but they're not absolutely required. Um, for example, a sleep timer is useless without a player. That's just, that's my point. So uh, you decide based on your own judgment, what goes into the MVP and what gets cut. So you have your own vision, your own, whatever, you know, to some people, a share feature might be completely useless to your, to your vision, to your app idea. Sharing might be the bee's knees. It might be the most important thing that you need, et cetera. So that that's, you get to choose. And therefore you might think, well, because it's, you know, just a list of features and I'm choosing it and I'm the one that decides it, it seems like making an MVP and Therefore, making a plan and executing it to build this MVP is just really straightforward. Make a list, execute the, or make a list of features, execute the creation of the list of features at a high level, of course, and that's it. However, there is more than just the MVP. Uh, there, 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 sorry, there's more to the MVP than just the most important features. The execution uh, can make or break the can make or break the application. Specifically, misidentifying or not paying enough attention to what I'm calling project cornerstones. So. Project Cornerstones, which is not an official title, but I guess I'm coining it, are features that the project can absolutely can not do without at all, can absolutely not do without, and this is critical, and there's no substitute for either. So for example, if you're making a marketing website for a startup's new car, so there's a you know, new car company, uh, the MVP might be for the website, a slider, you know, a few co partner company logos, some contact information, a little bit of, little bit of text, just a minimum text, maybe a small feature list of the vehicle, maybe, you know, sign up here. Uh, and so there's a box there where people can sign up so that they can hear more about the car when more is released and that type of thing. So the first things you might think of is, okay, what, you know, what stack will I use? Will, will you use a template? You know, are you going to go custom versus pre-built? Is it going to be a combination of that? Where will you host it? What will the domain be? And these are sort of the thoughts that you have when building out the MVP or executing the MVP or planning to, but all of these things and more are absolutely, no, they're, I, I'm not denying that they're absolutely necessary in the MVP. However, what about, or what is the cornerstone of the project? What is the one thing that this project this MVP, this website hinges on, it's the product. In this case, it's the car. So as a web agency that does client work, you might say that, you know, you've been hired to make this marketing website in this case, keeping into the same car example, you've been hired to make this marketing website based on an agreement that works for both parties. And so it's not your problem or concern as to how the car is doing. The car development or the car production team does their designing, their road testing, you know, all the rest of it. And you, the developer, the web developer in this case, worry solely about the website. And you're absolutely right in this in this regard. You don't have the expertise. You don't have the bandwidth. You don't know how to deal with making the car. You don't know. You don't know how to do it. They do, but they don't know how to make a website. You have the know-how on the website. They have the know-how on the car. So you shouldn't really care about the car at all, other than, of course, knowing enough to, you know, what pictures should we have? Should we, should we focus on this really cool feature of this new car? You know, that type of thing. You might, you, oh, I guess actually also just to, just to add to it as well. If you see signs that the startup is starting to fail and you know, your paycheck is in jeopardy, of course, that's when you start caring about the car, of course, like anything. But for the most part, you know, it's your job, nose to the grindstone, build this website about this car. And that's it. You don't care about the road testing and all the rest of it. But getting up, getting caught up in getting, getting caught up in this quote, the product doesn't matter mindset is, is a hard rut to get out of even when working for yourself. So many web agencies, offices, you know, startups, whatever you want to call them, don't do client work. Instead, they make their own apps. Maybe it's an open source project or something that they sell to customers. 
they don't work for hire. They don't they don't wait for someone to call and say, hey, make me a car website. Furthermore, there are tons of web agencies out there that do do client work, as with the car example, but also work for themselves too. And that's where that rut comes in because these guys might do 70% of their revenue from client work and 30% from projects that they do themselves. And so that, so they might lose vision on what that cornerstone of the project is. And they might get into that mindset of let's focus on the stack, the templates, what are we doing? They get, they get stuck in the, in the tech because they are a tech agency, but they don't pay attention to what, like in this case, the car, like if they, you know, what is the car? What is the cornerstone in this case? So some example projects that people might make for themselves would be open source apps or tools, as I've already mentioned, you know, mobile apps, blogs, general websites, whether they like I don't know, trees and they have a tree information website or something, whatever it is, right? Put some ads on there. Bam. That's a revenue source for your business. More complicated than that, but at a high level, you get the, you get the idea. Now, when it comes to agencies like this, specifically the combo agencies, the one that do client work and work for themselves, it is so easy, so easy. I'm going to reiterate this again for them to, for them to forget about the cornerstone of their project and instead get bogged down in that technical side. It is so easy to get bogged down in here. So here's actually a a real world example that happened to me. And I just sort of analyzed this the other day. And this is sort of the idea. This is where this whole cornerstone idea came from. So simple idea or simple example. Um, so I was working on a, a project called the Apex or the Apex, whatever you want to call it, um, which was an app, an Android app reviewing site. And we had a, a very small team of three people. And David, which is actually David Lindahl, friend of the show, he's been on a couple of times. David Lindahl and I uh, were working eagerly to, you know, figure out different stacks and tools and figure out the tech on making the website. How, you know, and actually, to be honest, it took probably too long to get even our landing page done. So we spent just a lot of time messing with the tech, even on the landing page and that type of thing. This took a lot of planning and a lot of work. Now, admittedly, a lot of it was David. I was still working obviously with digital dynasty design. And I think maybe this podcast had started at that point. I can't even remember, but anyway, we, you know, we finally got the landing page out and then we went to go plan with our writer right? Who, and we're like, Hey, like, let's get a content plan done. Let's get this done. You know, how will reviews be published? What's the schedule? You know, are we going to have a rating scale? Like what's going on here? But unfortunately our writer got swamped at work and at the time wasn't able to, you know, really to help out as much as we needed on the site. So that project ended up falling through the cracks and we spent all that time, right? Looking at different technologies, how to build the site and the landing page and the best way that we knew how, which CMS to use, you know, the whole bit, except for the cornerstone of the project, the thing that had no substitute, the actual content, the actual reviews, no time, no time was spent on that. You could say a tiny bit was because we had a writer, but at the end of the day, we weren't paying attention to David and I, when we were building this thing, we were not paying attention to that. We're just like, Oh, the writer will handle that. We'll just go work on this thing. And so, you know, it it fell through the cracks. So how I suggest doing this project now, if we reboot it, for example, is to take a template or even just a quick site builder and work out a content plan and figure out how much content we need, how the marketing would work, is the audience building up if once it goes live, how to manage the social channels, how to actually review the apps. So for example, how long on average should I be using the app and until I can write a review, stuff like that. All that logistics needs to be figured out. And after all that, and only after that, and only after this is going well, so let's say that plan was executed and it's working, then we can play with the technical side of things. Remember that the audience for something like this wants to read reviews on Android apps. They don't care that I built the web, the site on WordPress, that I built it on Webflow, that I used Tatamic, that I used some crazy thing, that I used React, like nonsense. Like they don't care. No, how many people have asked what Facebook is built on? They don't, they don't care. People like the general populace is like, what? Who cares? Like what type of rubber is in the, in the tires on my car? Like, I don't, I don't care. Like (laughs) I, I don't care. So at, after the cornerstone of this project, right, is solidified and stable, which is the content, as I said a couple of times, we can have, we can have at it on the technical side of things. That's the, that's the beauty of this. We can have, you can just go crazy. You can have virtually unlimited time doing the technical stuff at this point. So if we want to take something crazy, like three years perfecting a fully custom website with a perfect RSS feed and a fancy headless CMS and all the rest of it, it's all good. And the audience doesn't see it. They don't even get affected by it. As long as the content plan is being executed and it is working and it is fine, they don't care. And then one day they get a nice fancy new website and whether that helps us or hurts us or whatever it does, 
we had the time to put those hundreds of hours or hundred hours, whatever it is into building the site, but we knew that the content stood by itself. And that's the cornerstone of the project. And that's what I'm trying to get at. Yes, of course, the actual content was in our MVP. Yes, those reviews were in our MVP, but they weren't prioritized. It was just a piece of the puzzle, just a piece of the list, one list item in the list that was going into the MVP. And that's what hurt us. Now, this sort of advice, okay, applies to a bunch of different projects. So it applies to so many projects and cornerstones can vary wildly as projects very wildly. So I've broken down a few of the main sort of quote unquote categories, if you can call them that, that I can think of off the top of my head. So the most common cornerstone is the product itself. For example, the car as, as, as our previous example and Android reviews. Easy. The second one is technical features. So for example, if you're building a cross platform app that relies on the camera, but cross platform, but the, but the cross platform tech that you're using doesn't allow for the camera on iOS to be used you're dead in the water. So imagine if you were building something like Snapchat and then you, you build out all the social features and the messaging and all the rest of it. And then you're like, Oh, we don't have camera functionality. In that case, that technical feature, that camera is your, is your ride or die. There's, there's various libraries and templates and all the rest of it for messaging apps. You know, you could easily spin up a messaging app relatively, relatively sp easily spin up a messaging app and whatever. But if you cannot access that piece of hardware on the iPhone for some reason, and this is a fake scenario, but if you cannot access that camera with that stack that you chose, you're, you're screwed. You're already screwed. That camera needs to be there. That's the one thing that has no substitute. You can't just strap a camera onto an iPhone. That is your cornerstone. Another one, legal limitations. So if your app or product requires, let's say, constant access to a microphone for some reason, if, if that's in a jurisdiction in which that is not allowed... Like then you're, you're again, dead in the water. You're already dead in the water. Example, prime example, Google Nest. Can you imagine going up to a Google Nest device and pushing a button to activate it? Now I know some of you'd be like, just push the button. Yeah, but I already have one in my pocket. So the Google Nest devices, the Google Home devices are completely useless then. I might as well just pull the thing out of my pocket and push the button there instead of walking over there and pushing the button on the table. That's useless. So... Those are the three sort of main categories I thought of. And I'm sure with, as projects go along, there's probably tons of others that people can think of, especially out of tech, of course. There's probably tons of stuff in cars and pools, like, I don't know, anything, right? Construction, whatever. So now you might be saying to yourself, and this is sort of reiterating some of the points, but you might be saying to yourself that your MVP's feature list would catch these issues. You might think like, oh, Matt doesn't know what he's talking about. And, and you might think this fe the, my, my feature list is going to catch these issues or cornerstones. And especially if you're the one building the product. So for example, if you're the one building the camera functionality for a Snapchat like app, however, it is so easy. It is so easy. And I'm just reiterating this stuff. It is so easy to get stuck on say item five of a 10 item MVP list only to find out that you didn't take a really serious look at the camera functionality because it was item 10. It was the last item. Yeah. Your MVP list caught it after you spent 200 hours looking at the rest of it. That's the main problem. And that tears the entire project down. Now, if a feature, and this is just like a closing sentence, basically, if a feature of your MVP has no viable substitute, focus on ironing out that first, focus on ironing out that MVP feature first, and then move on to the rest. Yeah, honestly, like, I'm really glad I didn't read these show notes before, uh, before you went through them, because this was super insightful. And it's it's an extremely important topic. I've been stuck in the weeds on multiple different projects with this kind of thing. Um, and a really good example of something where we learned our lesson, Matt, is HTML of things. We realized that the podcast was the cornerstone. And that's where we focus all of our attention. Like most of our attention goes into making a good podcast rather than, you know, creating a great HTML all the things website. Because that's not, it's part of the MVP for sure, but it's not the cornerstone. Yep. If we can great, create that great podcast using all the technology available to us, like Podbean and all that, they already have a website for you, and we can reach as many people as we possibly can, then we have the time to create a great website for people that, again, like you said, they won't notice the difference, really. So that was a really, really good point. There's so many things to kind of take through that here. I feel like my suggestion for people would be to 
listen to that segment again. It's kind of like you did it pretty succinctly, so it's pretty short. So go through it again because there's a lot of little points where you can take away when you're planning a project. Project planning and project management are, I think, just as important as actually executing on on the project. Because if you don't project plan correctly, you're going to get stuck in exactly these issues. Like you're going to get stuck in exactly these limitations. You're going to you're going to focus on frameworks and infrastructures rather than focusing on the content itself. Like you're just going to get in, stuck into these cycles of like arguing about which framework is best. Like are we going to use React? Are we going to use Vue? Are we going to use Tailwind? Are we going to use Bootstrap? In the end, it doesn't matter which one of those you use because like you said, Matt, content is king. And even if you just don't even launch a website and just put all your content on YouTube or put all your content on Medium or put all your content on Dev.2, that's better than launching a half, like a fully featured framework website, beautiful design with no content. Like if you're going to pick one of them, you're obviously going to pick content because that's how you get people. No one's going to go to a website that's empty, no matter how good it looks. Yeah. No matter how well it performs. Like yeah. It can perform like, you know, you can, you can have no internet and it'd be performing perfectly, but there's no content there. Why would they go there? So there's just a lot of really important information that you went over that when if you if people are out there starting a first project or you know part of a team a lot of this happens when especially when you're part of a team because you lose track of what you're in charge of and what your team members are in charge of like you said with a three person team you and David were in charge of the technology and that's what you were focused on you had a third person that was in charge of the content but then all of a sudden you guys were like going well with the technology and you're like, oh, we should check in with the person that's getting the content. He's nowhere to be seen, essentially. Like yeah, he yeah, yeah he got busy yeah. as hell. Like, there's nothing yeah, you like do. Yeah, it's not his fault, but but that's that's what's going to happen. So you need to be able to project manage. And project management would have been would have alleviated that because if you would have had daily meetings or weekly meetings, he would have been telling you, hey, guys, I don't have time to write this. Like, I don't have time to write the content. Right. And you would have come back and be like, okay, well, can we get another writer? Can we, you know, go about this a different way? Maybe since you have time right now and you don't think you're going to have time in two weeks, maybe bang out some articles now so that we can take those, put them on a quick, you know, landing page website to at least get the ball rolling. I don't know. You could have done many different things if you would have handled it more streamlined, more more managed and stuff like that. So really good points again I, I feel like i'm gonna go back and listen to that episode again to get more points out of it so Damn. that's my suggestion to people well thank you <laughs> it took a while to write that script or like the show notes at least so mm -hmm. but yeah. it, it it's one of those it's one of those i don't know whether you'd, you'd call it a ux thing it might be a team ux thing where you just you lose sight of it I'm, i i can imagine you know what i when you were talking there, the first thing that popped into my mind is, and this is probably controversial, but Fire Festival. Fire Festival lost it. They did not have the product. They did not have the festival. There was there was problems and stuff like that, and I'm not going to get into it, but they had the marketing, they had the social media, they had the excitement, they had all of it, but they didn't have, at one point, they didn't have water. I remember watching the Netflix documentary. You know, this is... Like, that's 101. It's like, hey, guys, is there water there? No? Oh, all right. You know, maybe we shouldn't have a, <laughs> like, a fire festival there or something, or we should secure water or however festival people do what they do. But they, the the cornerstone of that was the festival, and they focused so much on the social. Now, I would like to touch on, actually, a fire festival is probably a good, good example. Fire festival having a great festival and no marketing ain't going to work either. That's why there's multiple features in your MVP list. That's why those exist in there. So marketing is a big one. But there are substitutes for marketing. Am I going to do Facebook marketing, Twitter? Am I going to do both? Am I going to do LinkedIn? Am I going to do this? Am I going to do cold calling? Like, what am I doing? There's substitutes. There's ways to do it. There's tons of ways to do it. Hire a marketing agency. Do it yourself. Do this. Do that. Do this. Do that. But there's no substitute for, I need, I need a festival. You can't just call somebody and be like, I need a festival in a couple of months. Like, what? Like, what's going on? You got to fly people down there? Like, what's, like, what are, what are we doing here? So, I mean, they lost sight of everything. At one point, they didn't even have an island. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. Like, like they <laughs> literally had nothing but the marketing. So, they, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really good example because they just, they went haywire with everything but the actual content, but the actual physical thing that people are going there for. Probably should have taken a year. I mean, I'm not a festival thing, but just from seeing the documentary, so armchair professional, I guess, or whatever they call those things. But 
Um, is that what they call them when you're sitting in your chair and you're being the you're being the person scrutinizing the the professional on the documentary or on the TV show? Armchair director. Armchair. No. I know there's a term called armchair detective. That's probably what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, um, something like that. But there's there's armchair a lot of things I think. But yeah, so I mean, from the perspective of a viewer of the documentary, like a year or something ago, they probably should have built out the festival a year before started building the marketing during the in-between season like in the winter-ish area right whenever and then have it have all those things approved have all the marketing materials approved so that they wouldn't have lost their island because i think they lost their island due to a marketing problem or something again please this is from this is please go watch the documentary please don't quote me on any of this but the point is then it then they would have been able to execute the marketing plan and their mvp their product their cornerstone would have been intact and planned. And if there was a problem, it's like, well, we still have the foundation. Let's just change this. But yeah, the whole thing fell apart. Like what a boondoggle. But anyway, yeah, like you were saying, so the, the prioritization is a big one. So cornerstones can be set and then you just need to prioritize correctly. So make sure that, like you said, your, your three points, make sure that the product itself is there. <laughs> make sure that the technical features that make that product actually exist are there. Yep. So like the camera example of Snapchat, if you don't have a camera, you don't have Snapchat, done. It's already over. Yeah, it's over. Yeah. And make sure that the legal limitations, for instance, like make sure that if your program relies on uh, maybe a name even, or your marketing relies on a name, make sure you can actually use that name. Or maybe your marketing relies on, you know, other TV shows, like TV shows, for instance, your your market your your product relies on showing TV shows. Make sure that you can actually legally show TV shows in your application. You probably can't. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. That's and that would be the end of the project. Like yep. if you and your buddy sit down and you're like, "Oh man, we should make a really nice TV show app and beat Netflix." You're like realistically, if you start going ham at the technology, you're not going to get there. Not going to get get there at all because <laughs> there's how, how much of the the Netflix budget is production of the actual films and stuff like that. Like the app is the app is made and it is being iterated <laughs> yeah, yeah. upon, and it is a it is almost an afterthought. Now it's like, absolutely. damn, we need to have a better movie, better a better Tiger King or whatever. Yeah, that's absolutely an afterthought at this point because it doesn't matter. Like as long as their content is good, you're gonna keep subscribing to Netflix. The app has to work. It can't like keep kicking you out or something like that. Like it can't it can't be a UX disaster either. Yep. Um, it has to work. It has to allow you to watch the shows, but it doesn't matter. Like it really, really doesn't matter as long as they keep producing stuff like the new Michael Jordan documentary, the Tiger King thing, anything that's viral. Really, people will continue to subscribe to it, and they they spend, I believe, billions on that at this point, like on actual original content, which is crazy to me. I mean, they but, need to do it because that stuff will be yeah. on there forever or virtually yeah. forever, you know, but, whereas the other production companies can take their stuff like Disney. Exactly. And the point, the point being here is that when you're sitting down and planning a project, try to find your pillars and try to make sure that your pillars actually are doable. Those are the things like just make sure that you can have the technical features, make sure that you can create the content. Like maybe you're super busy and you can't write those articles. And like then it's, you're just, screwed. it's just the realistic, yeah. And then you're screwed. Over. Then don't don't start the project. Yep. Make sure that you have the time to write the articles because Matt and I have always had this issue where we have these great ideas, but realistically, like Matt's working ridiculous amount of hours, I'm working a ridiculous amount of hours. We have to limit our expectations. We have to be able to do what we can do. That's why we settled on the podcast. That's why we're slowly building the site sustainably and stuff like that. Like we have everything in the plan and we have we're going everything, but we're doing it sustainably so that we can actually produce something. Instead of just saying, oh, we're going to be building a site with like a guide every week, news articles every week. Let's do a pod. Let's do two podcast episodes a week. Let's get like six YouTube tutorials a week. Like, let's get going, man. Let's get going. Yeah. It's, get it done. There's there's because it's, it's not a matter of sitting down and writing. It's a matter of you have to know what to write. There's like a creative process there. If you're tired, yeah. it's not going to go well. If mm-hmm. you know, if you're too awake, if you're too jittery, it's not going to go well. If you're busy and stressed, it's not going to go well. And like, what are you going to do? It's not, it's not a matter of sit down and type that article out. Well, okay. But I mean, I didn't have a topic, you know, <laughs> like there's a lot yep. to it. So there's absolutely a ton to it. And my suggestion, another suggestion that I would have is if you're thinking about doing like a review site or a site that's, you know, based on article, like guides or something like that, my suggestion would be write those guides, like write, see if you can, see if you can actually do the content before you even start thinking about the techno- technological aspect of it. it. 
again, this is another thing that I want to point out is that this is very dependent on your goal for the project. Because sometimes your goal of the project isn't really to, you know, attract a million people to your site and get ad revenue and, you know, whatever, just get as many people there. Your goal of the site is to learn new things. Your goal of the project is to explore new technologies. Your goal of the project is to just write for fun when you have time. It's not like it's literally not to gain an audience. It's not to gain income. Then you approach it from a different aspect, in my opinion. Then it's okay, like maybe because again, your cornerstone then would be learning new technologies and therefore technical talk, like going through frameworks and stuff like that. That is your cornerstone. Yep. That is something that you can put on your resume because that's your goal of this project. But when your goal of the project is to, you know, attract users to your site to be able to read your articles or read your guides or read your app reviews, then that's your goal. That's your cornerstone. And that's what you have to make sure at least you can do that. At least like that's your minimum. Yes. And then the technology on top of it. And the thing is, too, and, and this is more specific for web devs, but there is sort of like a shame or maybe some disdain towards using pre-made tools where people go like, I don't really, you know, I, I know how to make a site. Like, why would I use a WordPress template? But we had a project recently where I looked at it and was like, this this site needs to be up in a week. There's no, like, there's a 0.0% chance that this is going to be done. I And design didn't really matter for this particular project. So I built the entire site for the most part in a, in a WordPress template. You know, I'm not ashamed of that. And it got the job done. At the end of the day, that content on that site needed to be up for a customer. And it needed to be up damn fast. And so even though it's a project for yourself, which might even carry more disdain with it, because you're like, well, I know how to make my own website. It's going to look stupid if I use a template. Not to the audience. Like maybe if you go around and talk to other devs, you might get kind of shamed a little bit and be like, why didn't you do that, bud? But if you just say, I wanted to see how the content went and just like, who cares? You know, who cares what the other devs say? Because how much of your audience are other devs, unless you're writing guides, of course, but you know what I mean? There's no there's no shame in writing developer articles on Medium, for example, and that's a pre-made blogging platform. And why aren't you doing your own thing? You know, no one, you know, it doesn't matter. I think I think that I think that maybe the community is growing out of that a bit too. Like I feel I feel like there's a lot of devs out there that are just solely WordPress devs. Some guys are just WordPress guys. There's definitely people that have built their whole portfolio and business on Word on Webflow or at least a good portion of it and stuff like that. Like there's just such a a wide array of it now, but when it comes to the real techie guys, like Mike and I are pretty techie. If we're, you know, we, we feel like fools or sometimes you feel like a fool not using the most technical solution. But then when you give in and use that consumerized solution, you're like, holy crap, that was fast or damn, this is easy. And then you're like, man, I need to like, I need to lay off of trying to be, you know, so it's not even professional. I was going to say professional, but like uh, trying to do everything myself. Even, trendy. Trendy. Yeah. Like you and I, Mike, we went to school for embedded. We, you and I can easily, easily make uh, lights that flash at Christmas. We can make the actual controller that makes the lights flash. We can do that. We have the know-how. We know how to order the parts. We know where to get it. We know how to order the boards. We know how to make the board. Like we can do that. We can build that little component. Am I going to do that? No, I'm going to go to Canadian Tire and I'm going to go buy the <laughs> flashing lights and I'm going to plug them in and press the flash button and they're going to flash and that it that's it. Shame. See, but some people <laughs> would say that like why don't you just build it yourself? Because that's ridiculous. You know? I could yeah. probably build my car radio or your car radio just a car radio. I'm sure we could figure something out. I mean, it would take a while, but you know, we could do it. We could figure it out, but you see, it's ridiculous. So I think we need to step back from that and realize sometimes there's a reason why there's pre-built solutions and it's not just for the people that don't know what they're doing. It's for people that just don't have time. I'll bring my computer to a computer t- computer tech if I don't have time. If we're really, really busy, this computer goes down, right to Canada computer as it goes, and I'm going to continue working on my laptop or like whatever, or vice versa. That's exactly what's going to happen. Don't have time to fix this? Well, here you go, bud. Is it going to cost me more money? Yeah, but I also put in more work hours, so did it cost me more money? So... That's a good way to think, actually. A, a lot of the time, people try to do everything themselves. But if you're busy, like if you're not busy, okay, fine. Oh, absolutely. Fix your fix your computer. Fix your you know kitchen sink. Fix fix your toilet. Fix your entire house. Like build a house. <laughs> fix your I don't care. House. Like well, whatever. Like people people can do that. If you're not busy, then just do it. But if you're busy and you're making money and every hour is costing money, and then after work you want to go home and fix your piping, 
and drain yourself and then get burnt out because you're constantly working either at home fixing your house or at work, you know, doing your programming, you're going to get burnt out. So it's better to actually pay a professional and get get some time off for yourself. That's that's my thought process on it. Although having said that, I want to move on to the web news now if you don't have anything else to add. Oh no, now. yeah, please please take it away. Which is a little bit of a contradiction because it's repurposing old tech. And because we're repurp- repurposing old tech, you're probably going to have to do some DIY, uh, and I'll get into it a little bit later. But I'm just going to go through some examples of how you can take older technology that you probably have lying around in a drawer, or maybe you can find at a garage sale, whatever, and actually use it and make something useful out of it. And I'm just going to name a few, but there's many, many out there. And I, the point of this is right now we're kind of in a quarantine state everyone's like there's a lot of unemployment people are trying to you know save money so i think it's important to start thinking about how to how to save money but still be able to do the things that you want to do and use all the stuff that you already have like don't throw something out if it still works essentially use it and do something with it so one thing for web developers uh is if you have an old laptop or computer lying around create a web server with it like put you know, Linux, Ubuntu, CentOS, whatever on it, put a Linux distro that can work on that laptop or computer and put Apache or Nginx or whatever, create a web server and then get it working externally somehow, like go through guides and get it working because doing stuff like that, when you're a web developer, it's a triple edged sword. Like you have tons of benefits. A, you're repurposing old technology. So it's not just lying around gathering dust and dying. Um, B, you're gaining expertise in uh, doing DevOps, like, you know, firing up a server, because at some point, maybe you're going to have to do some DevOps, like whether it be on a cloud server, whether it be on a local server, like if you're in a working in a big company, and they have their own servers in house, you might have to do the actual setup of the server, or you at least the knowledge of how the server works will give you different benefits, like it'll you'll know how to write a site better. It's again, that concept of to the metal coding. So when you know how the binary stuff works, the assembly coding works, the very to the metal coding of a, of a computer, you'll write better code because you know that everything that you write has to be transcompiled, transcompiled down to that level. So the more you write, the more contradict, the more rep- repetition that you write, the more stuff has to be transcompiled down to, uh, you know, a bunch of zeros and ones. So the less you write, the better, and the more efficient you write, the better. And that's the kind of mentality that you you start to appreciate once you know when, once you know stuff like assembly, stuff like C, like really, really to the middle coding. And that's the same thing with web servers. So when you know how a web server works, when you know how the routing works, when you know how setting up like the HD access files works, when you know how uh, to set like all all of the configuration files that go into Nginx and, and Apache, when you know how those work you'll understand better how to write your site more efficiently for those platforms. So, and again, and the other the other benefit is that you create a test server. So, throw Docker on there. You can have multiple different instances of a different of different websites, of different kind of technology, of different stacks. You'll have experience with Docker. There's like a million benefits into creating a web server for a developer even if you're not a DevOps person. Even if you're just a front-end coder or you're just a back-end coder or whatever. It's still, in my opinion, important to know how the web server works because that's what you're going to be communicating with. So moving on here, uh, this is less web related. The rest of them are less web related, but I want to start off with something web web development related. But the next thing here is a media server. So again, old computer you have, old laptop. Make sure it's not ridiculously old because like you're not going to be running a Pentium four, and it's going to be it's not going to be able to c- compile or or transcode. Um, like a 1080p video. It's just not going to happen, most likely. Uh, but a, like a, a decent, you know, even 10-year-old laptop could still handle a si- simple Plex server for like a small family. No problem. Uh, I will say, though, there's ways around it. Um, you can do direct streams, stuff like that. So as long as the NIC and the soft and the uh, the, the storage is fast enough, you, you can... So you're, you so can, you're saying a Pentium 4 could handle like a really simple Plex installation? I've... My uh, I used to use a uh, Raspberry Pi too. Do you think a Raspberry Pi two is less powerful than a Pentium four? Or more I, I don't know. Yeah, that's honest. the question. Uh, but yeah. I have used that and a Core two Duo, and both Core two Duo. Both have yeah. Worked. I, 
yeah, Core 2 Duo, I believe, is, is is still definitely powerful enough to run a simple Plex server as long as you're doing the... Direct stream. Direct stream, yeah. That's essentially giving the... Your device is the one that's doing the transcoding. Is that correct? No, so it's... Well, yeah, so technically. So it, it's literally just basically using Plex as a file server. File. So you just say play, and it just plays the actual file that's running. You actually cannot select a different at a different quality on your right. end. So you're just essentially playing a file. You're you're just playing a file. So it's just like a library manager at that point. And it so there's caveats. Obviously if you have bad internet and you all your files are 1080p, then that's not gonna work. Stuff like that, right? There's caveats to it, but there's ways around yeah. it. Like if you only have cheap hardware, you don't have the budget, there's ways around it. There we go. So you can still even even get away with something like that. But it's cool to have a library management server. Like, I mean, Matt can talk forever about Plex, but it, it <laughs> I've I've used Plex for a really long time. Uh, my parent, like my parents, are on my Plex server, so they can like if they ever need anything, I can throw it on there, and they can watch it directly from Plex. Like if it's not on any other device, and I've bought it, and I can just rip it uh, onto my computer and throw it on there, and they can watch it. Even though I'm not at home anymore, they can still connect to my Plex server, which is really cool. Um, so definitely look into that if you're into media management, but then another one you can do is if you have an old windows computer specifically, you can play old retro games because a lot of the time, if like, if you have a computer that's running windows XP, uh, or windows seven, even a lot of older games will work better on that. Oh yeah. And on like a windows 10 installation. Yep. There's a reason why like HD remasters are sometimes praised because it's not always just a cash in. It's because they need, it needs to. Like there's games just don't run on old hardware, like or on new hardware. Exactly. Like Diablo, the first Diablo has a hell of a time running on new hardware. Exactly. So, but but it will run great on a Windows XP machine. Yeah. And, or no or problems. the if you buy the GOG version, like if you're not using your CD version, that one's been you know retrofitted and for a modern machine. Yep. But yeah, it'll it's a great nostalgia device. So I I'm doing this kind of right now, um, with. Heroes of Might and Magic 3. I don't know if you ever played that, Matt, but it's a fantastic old game from like I've 1999. I've played Heroes of... I've played one of them. I don't know. I couldn't tell you which one. Yeah, the, it, Really, the only one that matters is 3. All like The first two are really good, too, like for old retro games, but 3 puts it on a totally different level, and after that, everything is just garbage. I remember playing Dark Messiah of Might and Magic. Yeah, I remember that, too. That's actually a pretty good game. Um, yeah, it's, it, but this it, is nothing okay. like that. Yeah, this is like a turn-based... Uh, I want to say like it's not like Civ, but like you know that that kind of atmosphere where you're okay. collecting, like you you go around getting castles and stuff like that. But anyway, so that's a really old game from 1999, um, and I have this old Windows 10 tablet. Now this isn't really exactly relevant, but I have a really old Windows 10 tablet, like five or six years old, really really poor hardware, but it runs this game perfectly. And this game is like, even though it's from 1999, is almost perfectly designed for a touchscreen. Oh, that's crazy. Because it has like hot seat multiplayer. So my wife and I like pass the device back and forth while we're sitting there watching TV. And she takes her turn. I take my turn because it's turn based. So it's it it was a perfect repurpose of that laptop. Like that laptop was sitting in a drawer for two years, probably never touched. And then I was like, you know what? Like, well, I want to play this game. My wife wanted to play this game. Why don't I just put it on there? And it was like a perfect repurpose. So if you can find like, I think it would run Civ really well. Um, it that's might run an old total war really well if you would just do auto battles like with a touch screen that was that's it's, always the killer in, in in total war is the full rendered battles that yeah. always kills computers yeah i remember playing yeah, it on windows 98 computers. and it's like oh fuck my army's too big i better auto resolve this one yeah that's exactly I, I, I had that situation too but like if you just auto resolve it works perfectly fine and a lot of the total war game like it does have a really fun battling system but a lot of the fun comes from like you know actually managing your armies and stuff like that yeah the conquering of the land yeah yeah so again repurposing old old, old tech great fun uh another one and this one again this is a more diy project uh is create a wall mounted kitchen pc so if you have like an old laptop or an old computer with like a an old monitor and you're handy like if you really go in your hands you can create an enclosure that you can wall mount and uh, then it doesn't take up any counter space and you can, you know, watch your Netflix, not watch your Netflix, watch your, like, see your recipes, um, just really basic computer stuff in your kitchen. And you're not ruining a, you know, an expensive tablet because a lot of the time, like, I'll be personally using my iPad in the kitchen. But really, there's a lot of crap that's going on around me, like when I, especially when I'm cooking. 
and I constantly get like oil on my tablet or whatever. I would rather not do Jesus, that. What are you doing your old... tablet? Like, well, like when you're cooking and you have like a not a huge kitchen. Call the Google Nest Hub, bud. Yes, Google Nest Hub can work, but again, you're that's a new piece of technology. You can just you know throw an old piece of technology there. You're not oh yeah as careful. With I, it. I guess it's this okay. is repurposing, not purchasing a exactly. new yeah, equivalent. Don't, don't be purchasing a yeah. <laughs> if you have an old laptop sitting around, use that in your kitchen. That's what I'm trying to say. And mount it, it to the wall if you can. That would be cool too. Um, another one here is creating an emulator machine for old school gaming for yourself or kids. Like um, my nephew, my nephews, uh, they're getting to that age where they they want to start playing games or like eight, nine, uh, ten, like I think, yeah, eight or, eight or nine, I think is the oldest one. And I think I'm going to start considering converting maybe my old PSP or something into an emulator machine. So put all my old ROMs on there that I've purchased just to clear like all the games that I would have, just put a, put them on there and uh, just throw it, throw it at them. Because I think in my opinion, when you're starting out in your gaming experience as a kid, it's better to start out with the most basic because first of all, it's a lot more family friendly for the first thing. Like it's not as violent. It's not as crazy. Yeah. And it gives them an appreciation through the time. Cause if you start them out right away with like a, you know, PS4 and the best game, like, I don't know. Like Ghost of Tsushima or Ghost something. Of Sh- just immediately. Just Ghost of Tsushima. Them, it's like, them. what the hell is a map? Like, what do you mean I have to navigate? Yeah. It's like, well, you need to yeah, find this village. So like, come on. Yeah. But if you start them off with like Mario or Lion King, well, Lion King is a tough one. I don't know. Have you ever beat Lion King for Sega? You're going to hate me for this. I hate Lion King, the movie. And I had never played the game. Yeah, I do hate you for that. Yeah. Moving on. That's a great game. <laughs> well, I've never, I've never played a, the game. It could yeah, be a great it's game. A, it's a fantastic game. It's a fantastic movie. And uh, I hate that movie. The game, but but that game is extremely hard. Same with Aladdin. Have you played Aladdin? I've watched Aladdin. I used to like it as a kid. I've never played. But Aladdin. You never played. You never played the game. Stupidly hard. Um, I was a weird like PC are, are really gamer hard, back but, then. But it's easy to get. A, like you know, the, the controls are really simple. And it's really easy for younger kids to pick them up and go through it. And it's not as, A, it's not as addictive and it's not as uh, cancerous as like mobile games right now where they're throwing ads at, at the kids and they're throwing like uh, crazy addictive personality things where like they're trying to get them to collect more coins. And if they collect more coins, they can play longer. Like those kinds of things, in my opinion, aren't great starters for kids. As they go on, maybe you can throw them on, but uh older games is where i would go the season passes like the battle passes are a slippery exactly, slope yeah. like i remember i mean this is repurposing old tech but just a real brief aside i remember you you and i were talking and i just had like a freak out where i was like i literally look at the schedule of like i look for twitter posts from the from these four games that i play and they tell me when to play because they say my new pass is out or my new season's out or the challenges are out today and I go and I play Fortnite for this many things. Then I go and I play Pokemon Go because there's an event. And then I stop playing that and I go play Battlefield because there's a timed event. And I just like lost my mind. And I was like, I can't handle these timed events. Like, why am I being told what to play, when to play it? This is ridiculous. It's out of control. But yeah. I can imagine, like, I was able to stop that after a few weeks. I was like, what am I doing? Like, this is crazy. Probably a few months, actually. But what am I doing? But a kid... <laughs> Like, yeah, that's what I mean. Like, it's designed for them. Like, COD like that, Mobile? That kind of... Like, they're going to yeah. want that season pass, and I'm not sucking... Like, I understand that that's giving you content, and there's there's great things coming from season passes and stuff. I understand that. There's great content and stuff like that. But for a kid, I can see it being like, you know, he only has 20 days to do this, and what if he doesn't make it, and he has either homework to do, or he has to get the last tier in COD or whatever. Now it's like... It's, like, it's hard. It's, it is literally a difficult choice for a kid, whereas when you and I played games, it was like, I didn't get to the last level. I can do that next freaking month. Now it's like, nope, well, it's gone tomorrow. So are you going to do it today or what? <laughs> like, that's exactly it. It's that feeling of being left out and that feeling of not completing something and you can never complete it. And that's what they're trying to capitalize on. It's so predatory and it's predatory, but it's like, it, it, it's also good in a way The it is predatory, which is a bad part of it. But it's good in a way because you're buying uh, Fallout 76 is adding seasons. You're buying, you're buying, you bought a game and you're being rewarded for playing it. You play it a lot and you get all these rewards in a season. The problem is, what if I'm busy that month? Like That's actually like a concern with these season passes. I'm busy for the next two months. Now I'm the only guy in my friend group that doesn't have X skin. 
Yep. And I understand that that's like, we'll just get over it. I understand that. But for, especially for a kid going to school, it's like, that's not great. You know, mm-hmm. it's exactly it's a disaster. So anyway. Yeah. So I think an appreciation for older games will get them in a better mindset to take on that because it's not like we can get away from it now. Like every game has a season pass at this point. It's getting there. It's getting yeah, there. So it's like it's it's going to happen. So they have to just get used to it, unfortunately. But what are you going to do? Um, moving on here, though, uh, another really cool thing that I saw, and this is a YouTube channel that I follow called DIY Perks. He took a old TV, like an old LCD TV and an old monitor, and he created studio lights from them. Because what's happening, like if the digitizer is broken or if the panel is broken uh, and there's no picture out, the lights still work. Like the LED lights in the background or the LCD lights in the background, they still work. Usually, yeah. And they're real. They're actually pretty powerful and pretty expensive. Like they're they're a pretty big component. And when you put a good – like not only that, they have diffuser panels inside TVs. Those diffuser panels are also an expensive component. And so if you can repurpose the diffuser panel and the LED backlight and then build your own frame, you can create your own uh, – studio backlights like studio lights because they're really high quality that's perfect for anyone who cares a lot about recycling number one because you basically yep. you're just re-aiming a light you know uh mm-hmm. with the stand and stuff and number two is that's great for people that are into tech that are looking right now i'm sure there's tons that are like should i get into twitch but i don't like look at these studio lights they're really expensive I, they probably got i got a broken monitor over there <laughs> like literally right yeah. right beside me in the next room so yeah, i could you, repurpose that as a time. studio light and then I don't have to have a huge investment. And as I wanted, this is actually a little addition I'd like to add to all the points is don't be afraid to start at this level of repurposing. And if you outgrow it, just upgrade it. Because if you outgrow it, then you're into it enough. Mm-hmm. So they, exactly. if you're huge into Twitch and you're like, your handmade, your repurposed LCD thing breaks, you got your money's worth out of it. Now you know that you're into Twitch. You shouldn't feel bad. You're like, okay, should I repurpose another one or should I go buy a thing? If you're big into it, go buy one. Maybe you know if that's going to save you time. There's no, there's no Absolutely. shame in upgrading yourself from the repurposing. Mm-hmm. No, for sure, and that that's the way it should be. So that's a really cool project. I kind of want to take that project on. I'm not big on DIY to be honest, and I don't have a lot of time. But at some point, I have a few monitors that I've kind of shit the bed at this at this point. They just don't do a display out, but their backlight still works, and I kind of want to do it because. I'm planning on doing some coding streams in the future, uh, and it would be nice to have some nice lights to go along with it. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah. So. Uh, and I'll, the Elgato lights are damn expensive. They are. Like lights, like good studio lights, are expensive, and this actually does a really good job. Not only does it do a good job at studio lights, it actually does a good job at mimicking sunlight because of the diffuser panels oh, they use. Yeah, they, they, it's really cool. You can um, again, I've I've added the links into the show notes for the DIY perks uh, video of how to do it. And you can check it out. He actually he actually replaces a couple of like landing lights with these. And it looks like he kind of has windows and the sun's coming in, which oh. is, I don't know, it, it looks really nice. So if you're in a basement, another consideration for you, uh, this would be a really good like sunlight replacement. I wonder if, uh, I wonder what the comparison would be between, because like I just go to Elgato whenever I need something for streaming because I just, I just like it. And they have these, I think they're new lights, um, but they have lights. I don't know if they're new. I'm pretty sure they're new though, um, or at least new to me. And they have these really nice like stands and they like, I could put them behind the desks and like they come up, you know, they come up and then you could angle mm-hmm. the lights and stuff like that. And that's super nice. Uh, but they're like, I think they're like 200 or something a piece or something like that. Like they're, I know they're expensive and mm-hmm. it's like, Jesus, like, I don't know, like this is just a light. I don't know about this, you know? So yeah. this would be a nice introduction Absolutely. You know? As long as you have the time. The problem is that it's not like a, it's not like an afternoon project. It's more of like a probably a couple days. Although you could um, you could realistically like chip away at it for an hour a day unless something's time yeah. sensitive. Unless it's like like get get the epoxy, but then immediately weld this thing. It's like oh geez, like run over. You know, like I don't like many yeah. of these projects probably aren't gonna have steps like that. Like you got to do all this right yeah. to get right now, or else the food's gonna spoil. You know, yep. cook your dinner you at the same time. At <laughs> like. <laughs> You got to do it. You got to you got to cook your dinner at the same time as you're making this. But but yeah, so again, it's just another idea of how to repurpose old broken technology even. Um, another one here is smart mirrors. So again, DIY, DIY Perks has a great guide on how to create a smart mirror from an old laptop. 
as long as you have a, a monitor and a, an old mirror, I guess, or even get a new mirror, um, and that laptop monitor works, and you can just repurpose its hardware as well for the actual functionality of the smart mirror, you're good to go. So that's a good one. Again, what, what it's not smart, as easy. What is a smart mirror? So smart mirror would be like uh, you would use the screen without the backlight. Okay. Right. Without without like a without, and you would put it behind a mirror. In the actual glass mirror part, and you would actually it would actually be see through. So as you're looking through a mirror, like in the morning, you would actually be able to see the screen as well. Oh, okay. And what you can do is you can run like custom distros of Linux that have smart mirror functionality. So it'll show you like the weather. You can oh, like, run YouTube in a little window and stuff like that. So, or when you're brushing your teeth, you can put it as your bathroom mirror. Um, or a Google Nest Hub. You think they'd be a sponsor? Google, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like it, this one's not really easy at all. But again, if you're a handy person, you could probably do it without too much of a problem. It's not something that I'm probably going to take on because when I was looking at it, I was like, Jesus Christ, like you got to vacuum seal stuff. I, I'm not dealing with that. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes I'm reading it and I'm like, "This is gonna go horribly," and there's gonna be dust in there, like oh, or yeah. something. And it's like, I'm yeah, not I'm not, good, I'm not like, good. I'm terrible at. I'm terrible at doing stuff with my hands. I need. I want to get better. Like I want to get better at fixing stuff, but it's just it's not in the it's not in the cards yet. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, use an old phone. If you have an old phone sitting in the drawer, uh, you again throw some emulator software on there. Throw some older games. Give it to your kids. Play it yourself, like nostalgia, or even just play Get some games. Out. There's a lot of games that'll just run from the app store on there. True, like tr- old, like old mobile games. Like depending on how old your phone is, because it's some app store games are actually pretty demanding nowadays. The COD Mobile is Call of Duty. Like it's yeah, just it's just straight up Call of Duty. Yeah, it's like full on Call of Duty. Like same with Fortnite. Oh yeah, Fortnite's f- full on the game Fortnite. Um, so th- those probably won't run on your ten year old phone or five year old phone, but uh, plenty of games will. And there's some really awesome stuff uh, on the on the App Store and through emulators that you can do. Um, uh, and then last I have here is just like repurpose your old phones, give it to your kids, give it to your parents, give it to your grandparents. Lock it down a little bit because I've noticed like when I give when I give my grandparents a phone, I didn't just use the stock launcher on Android. I would I would I actually downloaded a purposeful launcher that has like really big buttons that locks everything down so they can't change things. But it has all the functionality that they need, so they could still, you know, access the WhatsApp, the Skype, the phone, the messages, and that's about it. Like I, I locked it down. But again, I repurpose old phones. Yeah. So you don't throw them out. They're not just sitting in your drawer. There's no point of them sitting in your drawer because the more electronics sit, especially with batteries in it, the more chance that something can go wrong. Like the battery could start leaking. Um, that could cause a fire. Even uh, anything like you know solder joints could go from being old and not being used for a long time like they could rust whatever there could be a million things but if you're using it usually it'll it'll keep itself up to date it'll keep up with uh, the battery will keep up with this charge it won't leak most likely it has less chance at least stuff like that so those are the I kinds of didn't know that that could char- car- mm-hmm. cause a fire because people got well you had a drawer of you had a bag of phones like Absolutely, and yeah. so it's like, old, geez, old like old I got a phones, timeline yeah. of Some blackberries of behind yeah. me. Maybe I should be taking those black, those those the backs off, like because you can take the bat the batteries out of most of them. You could, you could do that, or you could just charge them once every few months. Yeah, I suppose that's true. Yeah, just charge them, turn them off, and that's it. Yeah, every few months. That's a that's a good way of doing it. Um, Although the battery will eventually if- expand by itself because it just the actual. Yeah, it it will, but like you'll you'll stave that off for a while like right if they're if they're decent battery technology then you could you know you could be talking a decade or even more oh wow before they expand as long as you're charging them and stuff so yeah uh just think about it there's <clears throat> plenty of other ways to be able to repurpose old tech but these are just some that i thought of uh just start thinking about that kind of like it's not only for the environment it's for yourself too. just save some money yeah i mean one of the one of the big things I think for sure is is uh, money saving in this case, but it's also introducing yourself into something. Jumping into streaming and looking at all the fancy new t- fancy things like the microphones and stuff is like you're, it's daunting. But if you're able to mitigate those costs, then that's that's huge. Also, another thing that I I do, and this is more of a budgeting thing, but I'm very I'm I'm a big proponent of having nice things in an area in which you care about. So, like, I care about my phone, I have a nice phone, nice computers and stuff like that, gaming, but I will 
do everything in my power to not spend money on certain other things. Like I, I have a 30, like I have a, a 30 year old couch that a friend gave to me and I'm, you know, I'm going to continue using it. It's fine. It works. That's it. Uh, I'm not a person that will go out and buy new furniture every year. That's ridiculous to me. I'm not a person that I have a, almost a 20 year old car. Someone came to me today. Funny story. I just told Mike this. Someone came to me today, knocked on the door and was like, is that, is that Cavalier? Is that Cavalier still on the road? And I went out there and was like, what? And he's like, is that Cavalier still on the road? And I was like, yeah, I just, just came back from the shop. Those are actually new, like hubcaps or wheel covers. And he's like, oh, okay. He's like, I'm looking for a derby car. And I was like, okay. Like, I mean, I'm paraphrasing what he said, but like, it's like, so like, but I, you know, it's old when like, it's you know. old when, yeah. Like, Hey, is that car still on the road? Holy grace. <laughs> like, yeah. But no, to me, you know, to me, it's just like, it drives it. it it's safe. It's legal. Fuck. I don't care. Like that's it. I don't, I don't care. So, but that's how I budget. Some people always, you know, some people try to be, have like a, a big standard on everything. And I think that's what really kills people's money. To me, it's like, I don't, I don't care. <laughs> like when I go buy a car, I'm going to go buy a used car. End of it. That's it. I'm probably going to pay cash or at least mostly pay cash. I'm going to walk away. And then that, that's going to be the end of it. Cause I just don't care. Same works in video games, folks. I do the same thing in Fallout, and I got tons of money. So, you know, <laughs> the same thing works. So. But yeah, um, that's awesome. I think I think that's really a conclusive episode. Honestly, like it's nicely concluded itself. That was a great web news uh, and a great little conversation we had throughout the episode. So unless you have anything to add, Mike, I think we can run the old conclusion. Actually, runner up. So uh, thank you for listening, and make sure you don't miss an episode by subscribing on the platform of your choice. You can also follow us on the socials. That's at HTML All the Things on Facebook and Instagram. You can also follow us on Twitter via at HTML Everything. We're on Medium and we're on GitHub. And we're also on that Patreon. That's patreon.com slash HTML, all the things. Check out the tiers and give that a go. Many thanks to our $3 tier patron, Sean from RabbitWorks JavaScript. Find him at youtube.com slash RabbitWorks JavaScript. Garrick from Local Path Computing and Web Design. Find him at localpathcomputing.com. Craig, a.k.a. Cosworth. Ryan Gatchel from Blue Black Digital. Find him at blueblackdigital.com. Chris from the self-made, Chris from Self-Made Web Designer. Find him at selfmadewebdesigner.com. Tim from The Web Hacker. Find him at thewebhacker.com. And DL Ford from dlford.io. Feel free to leave a comment or a review on the platform that you're listening to this on. And we are signing off. Yeah.